So, uh, good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity of sharing um, some early results from a research project mapping midwifery unit provision across England that commenced um, about a year ago now. So we're still about halfway through, actually. These are the results of uh, the mapping that we did, and uh, we're doing further work in case studies in selected sites to try and understand mechanisms of facilitators and barriers to midwifery units and uh, why and why they're not set up. So the change from the birthplace study uh, in 2010 is, as that slide suggests, there's been a reduction in obstetric units. Um, I, mean, I haven't gone into a lot of detail on the slides, but as you know, there's a rationalisation of trusts, so they have merged. Uh, so some of them have now got more than one obstetric unit, uh, having at least two or three. Uh, so the reduction in obstetric units is there, uh, and that's reflected in also an increase in alongside the different units. That's the profound difference, really, um, of our mapping exercise. You'll see that the FMUs have remained pretty stagnant over that six-year period. Uh, increased by about three. We know that there's a kind of opening and closing element to FMUs in particular, uh, and why this conference is particularly important uh, in focusing on them. We're still left with a significant number of trusts, nearly 25% that don't have any midwifery units. Um, there's been a reduction, obviously, in those numbers, but um, there are populations of England that are not served by midwifery units, so choice for women is very poor. In, in those areas. In terms of what trust should be providing, this is a nice guidance saying that uh, every trust should have an AMU. It doesn't bite the bullet on FMU, says that you should have one or should, there should be one in a neighbouring area or adjacent area. It doesn't define what neighbouring or adjacent means. So if you kind of wanted to think, well, could we performance measure trusts on their provision of FMUs? Well, not easily because it's not uh, categorically stated um, what provision you should have. Uh, so there are some trusts who are doing pretty well with this. They've got both examples. They've both got MMUs, uh, AMUs and FMUs, about 23%, uh, and a much larger number have just got the AMU provision. Uh, but you can see that uh, the FMU is, is a kind of more equivocal provision. It's not a categorical one for every trust. So looking at places that are doing this really well, uh, interesting to, to look at places that have got multiple kinds of provisions. So these are trusts that have got at least two AMUs, so they're larger trusts that have got um, more than one obstetric unit, but they've got an AMU attached to each of their obstetric units. In addition, they've got an, MM, uh, an FMU as well. Uh, and then seven trusts with an AMU and two or more FMUs. Uh, and then 23, only about 70% that have got AMU and an FMU. And then that stands in contrast to places that have no midwifery unit provision at all. Um, and I suppose that's particularly noteworthy in places that have got more than one obstetric unit. So large trusts in different parts of the country uh, where there are no MU provision for a fairly significant population of women, of course, that are missing out there and then several places with just the one obstetric unit with no FMU, so nearly about 25%. <coughs> so interesting to view the places that have got multiple provision. This is just looking at um, FMUs. Um, you can see a range of trusts across the country uh, that have this. Those with multiple FMUs too, exist in large metropolitan areas as well as rural areas uh, and you can see the list of individual trusts across the top there that have got two FMUs uh, and then when you look at bigger provision than that so more than two three or four generally speaking you're looking at at rural counties more so um, where there's there's multiple FMU provision existing in rural areas like where we are here in Shrewsbury uh, and then down here you've got trusts with four FMUs, um, Bath and Shrewsbury and Telford. One of, the, one of your local trusts here I think was a, 
uh, originally a, a, an FMU, but now has an obstetric unit uh, on site, although quite a distance, uh, as those of you local were saying to me, we, we would classify that as alongside because it's co-located effectively um, in our definition of, of an AMU. Interesting to look at birth numbers in FNUs. Um, there's a few observations to be made here. So these are the largest FNUs in England. Um, and uh, looking at birth numbers between 400 to 650 births per year. Um, and one of the things that's worth noting is that the larger ones tend to be in places that previously had an obstetric unit that closed. So a city area that merged uh, either to a large obstetric unit within that city or to a neighbouring neighbor, a city and then opened up an FMU where the previous obstetric unit was sited. So you can see that for East Lanks, uh, for Caldervale and Huddersfield, for Gloucester, uh, and Maidstone and Tunbridge, uh, and the others uh, are interesting in that that's obviously a London site, um, and Bristol is interesting in having the Cossum Birth Centre there. There's two large obstetric trusts there, but they've got their own freestanding in the city as well that has significant numbers of births uh, in terms of the larger FMUs in the country. So, just interesting just to look at the configurations. This one here tells you a more complete picture of birth numbers in FMUs. And I suppose what stands out a lot there is that 37% of all FMUs are birthing less than 100 births a year. Um, so we've been talking today about the role of FMUs and how they become hubs with other services that make them more financially attractive because in the past the debate has been a little bit dominated by the numbers of births in terms of are these viable or not and we know that from the historical cycle uh, that FMUs go through most people just look at the birth numbers uh, up till recently anyway uh, as a rationale for keeping them open um, but you know uh, most of them are, are birthing small numbers of women uh, as you can see um, and the ones that I noted that had higher volumes were tending to be places that had closed obstetric units in city areas. Looking at AMUs, just uh, out of interest to uh, show you the volume of births that are going through them, um, they're obviously much larger. Um, at the top end, um, you've got one unit that's doing about 2,000. But three, there are over 1,500 births per year. Uh, but most of them are clustered here between 500 and 1,000 births. Um, and some are, are on the smaller end of the spectrum. So I, bet I will show you a slide in a bit about the contribution to total births in the country. And it's no surprise that AMUs account for the vast majority of, of the birth in midwifery units, as reflected in uh, the size uh, and volumes of, of women going through them. So that's in this slide, compared with birthplace um, back in 2010, excluding home births, um, the numbers of midwifery unit births has gone from 5 to 14%, but as you can see, the vast majority of that has occurred in alongside midwifery units, not in freestanding midwifery units. Um, so at one level that's very encouraging, uh, because it's virtually a trebling over a six year period. Um, but if you start then talking about what optimally could birth in midwifery units, then it may not seem so as so encouraging as that. Um, have I got time to share a few thoughts on this? This is a bit more controversial. This is saying uh, what volume of births could occur in midwifery units if we streamlined the service in a way that maximised their access. Um, and as I said, it's fairly, it's fairly debatable because we're kind of doing proxy numbers here. We're thinking of three points where women could be referred to an obstetric care pathway. One of those is after uh, registering with the service uh, when they've come in early pregnancy. And just moving forward to the future slide, it's difficult to get kind of stats on this. So these are really approximations. Um, and I think there's a whole debate to be had here about how our risk factors end up uh, streamlining women to obstetric care and whether that's always appropriate. 
uh, lots of discussions you could have with obstetricians and others about this, but essentially you lose over 50% after that pregnancy is registered in terms of where uh, women go. They're, they're going to obstetric led care pathways and less than 50% are staying with midwifery uh, led pathways. And then of course in pregnancy, uh, you lose around about 23, uh, 24%. Again, it's difficult to get definitive sort of robust numbers on this, and this is actually taken from a very old uh, home from home study. It's called Home Life Environment Study uh, that was done in the late 90s, a systematic review uh, that's in the Cochrane database. The Muvika study was Leicester, um, and the Begley study was in Ireland, so we're comparing sort of slightly different maternity systems here. But you can see that there's a loss to obstetric led care during pregnancy. And then when you're in labor, of course, there's another transfer that occurs. So we're then it's kind of trying to guesstimate, you know, what proportion of the original population could birth. And if you just work those figures through 28%, that's a very rough approximation, because as I said, the robustness of each of these figures is, is not that established, or there's not a necessarily a huge consensus around it. Apologise for just one little one error on this slide. This is um, actually more than one clearly because one's up here. But this is interesting to show you what's happening in AMUs as a proportion of the total births in their obstetric plus AMU settings. Uh, again it's back to this question of what volume of births could occur in uh, midwifery units from a given population. And this is what happens in AMUs in particular. Um, so you've got these different benchmarks here, 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, it goes up to 30. Uh, I said before that possibly around 28, 30 might be achievable, uh, could be a benchmark we could discuss or debate. Um, and as you can see, very few AMUs or AMUs linked to obstetric units are achieving that, there's only one actually. Uh, then there's nine that are getting around 25% to 30 of their uh, low risk caseload if you like and so it goes down for there and you can see the vast majority are getting under 20% and downwards um, which is sort of suggesting to you that the care pathways aren't working quite as well as they could be uh, or that utilisation of the AMU is, is less than it potentially could be. Uh, again that's another one for, for discussion and I haven't included FMU figures in there because they represent only about two percent and wouldn't make a huge difference to, to those numbers. So just to summarise, um, there's been a stagnation in the numbers of FMUs over that six year period. Um, I say better outcomes just if you compare, you know, the birthplace study, it's slightly better uh, in terms of outcomes and intervention rates in FMUs if you look at the, their data. Um, most of the FMUs are birthing small numbers of women, uh, way over 50% of birthing less than 200, 37% less than 100. Um, the larger ones tend to be where they've replaced previous obstetric units. The big change has been the doubling in alongside midwifery units, virtually doubling. Uh, but there still exists unequal provision across England in places where there are no MUs, so population groups in different parts of England are, are not having that choice at all. Uh, and then the burden of birth in midwifery units is going up. Um, it's up to about 14%, but if you think it could be over 20 uh, or even up towards 30, uh, there's room for expansion in that regard as well. And so wide variation in uh, utilisation as reflected in those latter slides there about the percentage of, of births that could occur in AMUs. Um, most are under 20%. So that's kind of a snap picture of, of how things have changed over that period. Uh, I just need to acknowledge our funder and other members of our team that are working uh, on this project with me, one of whom is here, Celia, uh, who's a research fellow with us. Um, but hopefully that's food for thought and for discussion for our panel. Thank you very much.